Last Sunday, I began to share with you on this subject from ruin to revival. From ruin to revival. We've been sharing about Nehemiah and rebuilding the city. And so we started talking about that last week. And I believe it's a prophetic word over our church. It's a word over our city. And I think it's a word over us as individuals. It's a word that although I'm preaching about rebuilding a city, for you it might be a situation in your home or your family. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in, in your job. Maybe you're having some issues and this is over that as well. Because here's what I believe. I believe over our city, God has greater things in store for Conneaut, Ohio. God has greater things in store for Kanye, Ohio. Somebody say amen right there. And today I want to share with you on this subject, the way forward. The way forward. How do we, when we look at where we're at, how do we determine where we are going? Last week we talked about Nehemiah. He lived in Babylonian exile. The Babylonians had come in. They had conquered uh, Israel and Judah, and Judah was, they were taken captive. And here is uh, this man, Nehemiah, who is living in a foreign land. He has lived his life there. And he inquires about Jerusalem. And what they tell him is horrible. In Nehemiah chapter 1, they say the city is broken down and the gates are burned. Jerusalem was laying in ruin. But God was about to send revival. See, God is the God of a turnaround. You may look and go, oh man, things, things got bad and then things got worse and now it's gotten horrible. God's the God that likes to move in those kinds of situations. Because when nothing else can, can possibly fix it and he comes in, you can't say that it was somebody else that did it. Nobody else is going to get glory. Nobody else is going to get credit. God likes to move in impossible situations. He likes to do what can't be done. That's who our God is. And God is a God of process. You know, as a Pentecostal, we tend to love instantaneous. Don't we? I mean, I love it when God just moves and goes bam and just, you know, night to day in a moment. And he can do that. I, I love to see him do that. I love it when I'm praying for somebody and there's an instantaneous and God heals them. I love it. I've had it happen to me. I know what it's like when God just all of a sudden turns it around in an instant. But most of the time, God does a turnaround that doesn't happen just in a moment. Even if it is a moment that something changes, there's a process that led up to the moment. Are you hearing me? And so I want to share with you that today because God is a God who builds things line upon line and precept upon precept. And as we submit to his will, not ours, his way, not ours, his timing, not ours, God will bring it to pass. Is that good? So if you have your Bibles in, in Nehemiah, one verse that I read to you last week, I want to read to you this morning. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, So it was, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. When he heard about how bad things were, he mourned. The first step in his process was to grieve for the past. We need to grieve for the past. There needs to come a point in the process that we look at our past and every sin that we come back and we go, no, that, I grieve over that. I repent over that. I want to turn from that and I want to make that right. Some people think that forgiveness means go around and just do things that are wrong and just keep on going. Hurt people and just keep on going. Just keep on repeating the same mistake is what you'll do. If you don't look at the past and grieve over the problems and the trouble. We need to grieve over the past, not only our past, but our city. 
And so Nehemiah went, and if you read chapter 1, he began to repent, and he repented not just of his sins, he repented of all the sins of his whole people. He repented of, of the sin of his nation and what they'd done. Some people today say, well, it's not my fault. They're getting what they deserve. I hear Christians with that kind of attitude. Well, you know what? That's biblical. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. They're, they're reaping what they've sown. You don't want anybody to look at you that way, but it's easy to look down your nose on somebody else that way, isn't it? Rather than have the attitude that, yep, well, they're getting what they deserve, maybe we ought to have the attitude, God, I want to get under the burden of repentance, and I want to pray a spirit of repentance over my city. It's easy for us to look at the problems in our city. There is, there is not a, a gift of the Spirit named criticism. The Holy Spirit doesn't come and say, I have called you and anointed you to criticize. <laughs> we need to be instruments of healing. Anybody can look at the past and define the problems. We need to grieve over the past. We need to pray over the past. We need to repent over the past. I said, we need to repent. We need to be people of repentance. Repentance means changing because of a realization of truth. Catch it, church. Repentance means God showed me a truth, so therefore I will change to submit to the truth that he's revealed to me. You know what that means? That means repentance isn't just a one-time occurrence. Amen. That means it's not just coming to him one time and say, Oh, dear Jesus, please forgive me of all my sin. Amen. That's the beginning of coming into his kingdom. But can I tell you, when you live in his kingdom, he needs to be the king. And the more you get in this book, the more he'll show you things in yourself that need to change. And every time he gives you a revelation, you know what there should be? Godly repentance. We should come back and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me of that. And Lord, I want to now change because you've shown me truth. That's a good word. So here's the key, church. Grieve over the past. But don't stay there. Grieve over the past. Grieve over sin. Grieve over the pain and over the hurt. But don't stay there. The devil wants you to stay in the hurt and the pain of the past. God's not telling you to live in the past. A lot of Christians are so bound, and the devil loves it. There's a prison on our mind because we can't get past the past. It will rob you of your destiny in God when you continue to live in the past. Nehemiah could have heard this and thought, oh, we've sinned. Oh, it's gotten so bad. Oh, God's brought judgment. And he could have just lived his whole life in a state of mourning and grief. There are some Christians who live their lives continually. You don't have to talk to them for about two minutes. And all that negative that's going on in their mind and the hurt and the pain, that'll start coming out of them. Acknowledge it. Grieve over it. Repent. Pray over it. And then go on. And move on for God. Is that a good word? So we do need to grieve over the past. But then we need to secondly pray for God's heart. And I'm not going to reread the scripture I read last week. But if you read in Nehemiah chapter 1... Nehemiah prayed, and as he prayed, it wasn't Nehemiah's prayer. He started to pray God's heart. He started to pray for God to come and, and for God to do a work. 
You know, when you get bothered by something, there can be multiple causes. Sometimes you're bothered because of the enemy. The enemy wants to get you just distracted, and so you, something just rubs you the wrong way and it bothers you. Sometimes you're bothered just because it's a personal issue. It's something with you. Maybe you're bothered. Maybe something that somebody does is just kind of bothering you. But can I tell you, sometimes the things that bother you, the Holy Spirit is at work. And we have to have the discernment to know the difference. Because when it's something from the enemy or when it's something that's just personal, it's just my issue, well, that's one thing. But if the Holy Spirit is moving, the things that bother me, you know why they bother me? That the Holy Spirit allows them? When the Holy Spirit allows that to bother me, it's so that he can use me to bring change. It's so that he can, can show me what he wants to do in this situation. Can I tell you, the more I pray, the more my heart changes. And the less I pray, the more that the, the struggle inside of me between my will and his will, my will wins that struggle when I don't pray. And it's subtle. There's a subtle change and a, a, just a subtle difference. Sometimes, you know, there's just things that are bothering me that shouldn't bother me. You get upset over stuff you shouldn't be upset over. And you know what? When that happens, you've got to pray. And you've got to say, God, give me your heart. Sometimes a person will bother you. I know you can't believe that anybody would ever have somebody else bother them. Some, sometimes somebody just steps on your last nerve. You come into church and you say, so help me if he comes over to me. Oh. You know when you're talking about somebody and your teeth are gritted as you're talking? It's not a good sign. So help me. And here's, can I tell you the prayer to pray? This, a student who I had the opportunity to pour into a lot when he was a, a young man, and now I, he's just went around the world and leads a missions organization as a phenomenal, phenomenal guy. Kyle Philippi, when he was a young man, I got to pour into Kyle a lot. Kyle came back from India on a missions trip, and uh, we were talking, and he said, man, there were people everywhere. And he said, the smell was horrible. And he said, we would get on buses. And he said, there's no such thing as personal space. People are pressed up to you and touching you and all. And, all, and, they're, and he said, it's just, it's, and he said, you know, I'm thinking, Lord, get me away from these people. But he said, we're here to minister to them. And so he told me, he said, this is how I pray, Pastor Carson. I pray, God, help me to see what you love about this person. That's a good prayer right there. When somebody ticks you off, start praying, God, help me to see what you love about this person. Help me to have your heart for this person. Help me to have your heart for this situation. Help me to have your heart for this city. Somebody say amen. God will change your heart before he changes the situation. The heart change has to come first. As we start to pray, we'll get more passionate about the things God's passionate about. And you know what? The other stuff, it won't bother us so much anymore. We'll, we'll start to look at the root of the problem, not the symptoms. Sometimes we look at the symptoms and say, oh, look at what they're doing. Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're doing. But then we get God's heart and we start to pray, oh, they just need the Holy Ghost to just touch them and do a work in their lives. And we start to pray over them. God will change us. Somebody say amen. So Nehemiah got God's heart and then he went to the king. And he shared what God had spoken to him after he grieved and prayed, and God gave him his heart. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 5, I want us to pick up there. 2, 5 says, And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. 
Now, if you were here last week, you remember who he was. He served the king. He was the king's cupbearer. And he's basically saying, can I go on a fully paid extended vacation? This was a pretty big request. Verse 6 says, Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. See, when you start praying over the past, repenting, and then getting God's heart, God will give you divine favor. I said, God will give you divine favor. God will line you up with his favor. The deal is, you can't just say, oh God, give me favor. Give me the stuff I want. And Lord, I want this and I want that. You need to go back to the beginning and you need to repent. And then you need to say, God, give me your heart. Change my heart out. Somebody say amen to that. Because then God will give you divine favor. And he then didn't stop there. He was bold. Read the next verse, verse 7. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through until I come to Judah. He said, I want, I want to make sure that when I go, I can tell everybody the king sent me. I've got... I've got orders from the king. I don't know about you. You know why I'm here? I've got orders from the king. I, I walk under orders from the king. Do you know why we're going to proclaim God's word over this city on Thursday? Because we've got orders from the king. You know why we're praying for change in Conneaut, Ohio? Because we've got orders from the king. Everybody that comes against me, they're not coming against me because it's not my will that I'm standing for. I've already grieved over the past. I've already repented. God's changed my heart and I want my heart to be his heart. And now God's given me favor so that if people oppose me, they're opposing him. Verse 8 says, And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, oh, and while you're at it, for a house for me. It's pretty good, isn't it? And the king granted them to me, Get this, not according to his will. Nehemiah didn't say because I was a, a good little boy or because, you know, he liked me so much. But according to the good hand of my God upon me. See, if you'll pray and seek God's face, God will line you up with such favor that even the heathen will look at you and, and, and they will bless you and not even know why. The king was, was not at all sympathetic to godly causes. He wasn't over here going, oh, we want to make sure that we rebuild the city of God in Jerusalem. That wasn't his goal at all. But the hand, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And the hand of the Lord can move on the powers that be and change their stance. Are you hearing me? Some of you wonder why you're bumping up against walls. Well, there could be a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons could be you haven't got God's heart yet. Trying to do things on your own, you get his heart and God, watch God bring things into alignment. Is that good? I'm believing God's called this church to greater things. And so I'm believing for even greater favor over this church. I pray to God, Lord, bring resources in, bring what you need in to line up for us to accomplish everything that you've intended for us to accomplish. Line up blessing. Amen. Is that good? Yes, Do you believe that? Yes. Here's what the Bible said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. God's got stuff prepared for you and you just need to line yourself up with him and he'll bring it in. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's got everything you need. 
Some people operate their whole lives in a spirit of lack. Some Christians operate in a spirit of lack all the time. And a, a poverty spirit can get a hold of you. And there's a, there's a poverty spirit that can, that can uh, actually disguise itself in Christianese. It's a spirit of, I never have, and I didn't, ha I didn't have enough, and, and, and I should get more, and, and would you just pray for me that God would do this and this and this, and I want this, and this is what, I'm believing God this and this and this, because I want more, and I want more, and I want more. That's a poverty spirit. Right? It's a grasping spirit. And what we need is we need to say, God, I'm not in this for what I want. God, I want to line myself up with you. And you bring everything to pass in your way, in your time. Is that good? Go on to verse 12. He gets to the city. And in verse 12, he's now in Jerusalem. And he arose in the night. I and a few men with me, I told no one what God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. So God had changed my heart. I had grieved. I'd prayed. I'd repented. God changed my heart. He gave me favor, but I hadn't shared it with anyone, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well, and you know I wasn't there because I wouldn't go to any place called the serpent well. The well of the snakes. I don't want to go over there. And the refuse gate. And he, he said, I viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. What a tragic thing that he now saw with his eyes. He went out, and I think it's unique that he goes out under the cover of darkness, and he sees everything in the dark. He sees through, through dimly lit areas what things look like, and it's a dark place. It's a dark area. He has already grieved over the past. He's already prayed for God's heart, and now he evaluates the present situation. He evaluates where he's at right now. And he looks and said, things are pretty bad. Church, we need to understand the reality of the situation we're in. Nobody said amen there. Sometimes we act like faith is ignoring reality. Faith is not ignoring reality. Faith is not just denying the reality that is there. Are you hearing me? That's a false faith. That's actually a very weak faith. Faith is actually not denying reality. It's looking honestly at the situation, but faith says there's more to it than what I can see with my eyes. Is that good? We need to understand there are obstacles, and some of them are big obstacles. When I was going back and forth to Cleveland Clinic, and then I was in the hospital, and then I was out, and then I'm back in the Cleveland Clinic, and you know, you all know the story, and they diagnosed me, and, and they told me, you have a neurological disease, there is no cure, and, and uh, you'll never get over this. We just hope with medication to be able to help you with symptoms, but you'll have this the rest of your life. And they're telling me that people, I, and, and, and people that, that I knew would pray, would, would say to me, how are you doing? And what do the doctors say? Of course, people ask me how I'm doing. I would say, well, I'm blessed. And say, well, what are the doctors saying? And then I would tell them, well, this is what, you know, I met the doctors this week, and this is what the doctors say. And I was so encouraged by several people who said something along this line. Good. Now I know how to pray. Because faith does not ignore the reality we're in. Faith looks honestly at the reality and then says, but now we're going to pray. Yep. 
Because that reality, it's not going to stay that way. Now we need to look honestly at where things are today. And then we need to know God's got more. I said God's got more. Evaluate where you're at, but don't let it discourage you. I hear some people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a realist. You're just not living in a real world. I'm living in a very real world. You can call yourself a realist, but you're denying true reality. Because there's a reality greater than what I can see or what I can hear, what I can smell or what I can touch, what I can feel, what I can taste. There's a reality beyond these senses. My faith tells me there is more. There is a spiritual realm that is above it all. Is that good? Yes. Nehemiah went at night and he did not go with a large group of people. I'm going to say this real quick. You cannot allow everybody to speak into your life. You need to be careful of voices around you. There are some people that if you share with them what God's spoken to you, they will begin to speak discouragement over you. And some people will say some things like, oh, no, that'll never happen. Oh, we tried that before. That won't work. No, you just, you don't even know. No, you don't know. It's, this is bad. Can I tell you, you need to be very careful. Some people will not receive the word that you share over them. Some people will distract you. Nehemiah, if he's walking out with some people, they would try to point out things and they would get his attention on everything else but what God had focused him on. Some people will discourage you. They'll, they'll say, no, no, look at how big this job is. This is too much. There's no way we could do this. Some people will try to dissuade you from what God has already spoken to you. You need to find some people of faith, and you need to have them in your inner circle. Amen. That when you start sharing with it, you know what God told me? That they start to say, oh, can I pray with you about that? Let's agree together. Wow, that's incredible. That's awesome. I believe God's going to do something great here. That's what you need. Are you hearing that today? All right, go on to verse 17. As uh, he's, he's going down through, now he speaks and he says, I said to them, you see the distress that we're in and how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. He was very honest about the situation. But he said, come. Come. Let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. He grieved over the past. He prayed for God's heart. He evaluated the present situation, but then he walked in obedience to God's word. This situation is big. There is a huge obstacle. We're looking at it squarely in the face, but now let's start working. Are you hearing me? Somebody ought to be shouting on that one. Let's start working on it. Some of you say, you know, my marriage has had a horrible past and, and things have kind of broken and, and, and messed up and I don't even understand it all. And, and, and now I look at it and I don't think there's any hope. You know what you need to do? You can, sure, you can repent. Go back and repent. Go back into the past and repent. But don't live in the past evaluate where you're at and then you need to say but you know what from today forward I can't change yesterday but from today forward I'm going to walk in obedience to God's word God's going to come and I'm going to build something here other people might say it's impossible but I'm going to stand in the gap and I'm going to believe God and God's going to show up this thing may be bigger than me but it's not bigger than my God my God is with me so nobody can stand against me other people might look and say the obstacles in our city are too great. They're too big. But no, no, no. My God has called me. My God has anointed me. My God has given me his heart. And I walk in obedience to his word. Amen. Amen. All right. I'll read a few more verses and I'll get ready to preach. Verse 18, he said, and I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me. 
and also of the king's words that he'd spoken to me. Said, I told him, God, God's been on all over this thing. The Holy Ghost has spoken this to me. And I went to the king, and God gave me favor, and I'm under orders. So they said, let us rise up and build. Now let me ask you, he's talking to all these people who already had lived in that city. He's talking to people that every day saw the state of the city and could have done something, but they hadn't done anything. Nehemiah did not bring a huge workforce from Babylon to do the work. He found the people in the city who were living in the middle of the rubble, who were in the mess, who were probably every day looking at the mess, talking about how bad the mess was, talking about how impossible the obstacle was. And Nehemiah said, but I just tell you, I grieved, I prayed, I repented. God gave me his heart. I'm, I've got his favor. I'm looking at the situation. And when they heard that, they said, let's go. Let's go. We can do it. We, you know what? We just need to have a we can do it attitude. Not in my ability. It's not by my might. It's not by my power. It's by his spirit, says the Lord. And then they set their hands to this good work. Wow. Wouldn't you love it if it just ended right there? Set their hands to the work and it all got done and they all lived happily ever after. They started to do the work. And then verse 19, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us. And they despised us. And they said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? And so I answered them. And I said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. See, the mistake of the enemy was the enemy was, was, was laughing and ridiculing, thinking that their ridicule would cause them to stop because they, they referenced what they thought was the highest authority, the king. They said, well, you know, the king's probably going to be upset about what you're doing. Well, they didn't, they didn't even know God had already given them king's orders. But note that Nehemiah, he could have responded by pulling out the papers. He could have said, no, the king's on our side. But he didn't say that. He said, there is a higher authority. I don't care if the city manager is for you or against you. It doesn't matter if the mayor is on your side or the other side. It doesn't matter if the governor stands with you or against you. It doesn't matter if the president of the United States opposes you or is for you. There is a higher authority. He is the God of all of heaven. And when, when Nehemiah spoke, he had such conviction. He said, the God of heaven, him himself will prosper us therefore we his servants will arise and build but you and he's and I, I can just imagine the finger coming out of that point point right at him right in the nose but you you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. He looked at him and said, you think that you're somebody? You're a nobody if you're standing against my God. You can come against me. You might think you're just coming against a man over here. But when you attack my God, let me look at you square in the eye. As little David said to Goliath, he said, you know what? You're, you're coming over to me with a, a sword and a shield. But I come to you in the name of the God of heaven whom you have defied. Prepare to die, buddy, because you aren't just coming at me. You're coming at him. I stand here today knowing whom I have believed. My 
my faith is strong in him. Let me tell you, he'll accomplish his word. He will accomplish what he told you to do. He will make sure that he brings it to pass. I told you I'm getting ready to preach. You grieve over the past. You pray for God to give you his heart. You evaluate the present situation. Then you just start walking in obedience to God, God's word. And then you believe in faith for the future. God's given you a vision. God's spoken. Don't you, don't you lay down what God's spoken over you. Some of you, you're, you're, you are praying and believing God for your kids to come back to the Lord. Don't you lay that down one day. Don't you believe the voices of the enemy that say he'll never change, she'll always be that way, the situation will always... Don't you believe it. Don't you believe it for a moment. You keep on standing in faith. You keep on saying, God, I know that you're faithful. I know that you will do everything that you have spoken. You know how I know that? I'm the product of a praying mama and a praying grandma. God hears your prayers. He's heard your cry. Some of you have prayed over things and you thought, I don't even know if God's listening. I pray and it seems like every time I pray it gets worse. Rest assured. Hear me, your prayers are more powerful than Satan's plans. Pray on, pray on, pray on, pray on, church, pray on. Keep on seeking his face. Keep on working for God. Don't you give up the fight. You keep on standing in faith. I'll bring this in for a land in here in a minute. In verse 20, he said, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. The God of, of he- he's not going to send an angel to do this. He's coming down himself. I know we've got angels all around us. I know we're promised that he would give his angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways. But can I tell you this? God doesn't just have angels in Conneaut, Ohio. God himself. God himself. God himself will come down in our city. I'm believing it Thursday. Pray over our worship team. They're heading out Thursday. They're going on a going to a conference about worship for a few days. I was really hoping, I, I asked Steve, I said, Steve, we're doing this thing in our city, and, and I want you to come bring your guitar and do worship. And, uh, but they can't, they can't be there because they're going to head out that day. And Kama, we met and we're talking about it. I said, well, they can't be there. So they kind of scraped the bottom of the barrel. So they've resulted to getting down to the point that your pastor is going to be up there leading worship on Thursday night. Now let me tell you what. I'm believing with every song we sing, chains are going to fall. I'm believing with every prayer that we pray, addictions are going to be broken. I'm praying for bondages to be destroyed. I'm praying for yokes that are over people's lives to be broken. I'm praying for prodigals that are coming home. I'm believing God for souls in this city. I'm believing God for his anointing to flow. That it's not going to be a city that is defined by ruin. It's going to be a city that's defined by revival. Because God himself is going to hear and he's going to come down and he's going to prosper us. I just got to tell you what that means. 
The word prosper that he used in the Hebrew is saleach. Saleach means to prosper, to rush, to advance, to make progress, to succeed, to push forward. He said, God's going to push you forward. Mm. Mm. Some of you are going to stand up there to read, and you may, you may have, your knees might be shaking a little bit on Thursday when you stand up to read God's word. Well, I don't know who's here and what they're thinking. I don't know what people might think when I get up there. When you get up there, God's going to push you forward. You stand there in his authority. You begin to proclaim his word over this city. God's word doesn't ever return void. God's got big plans. I said God's got big plans. God's pushing you forward. See, I'm believing for godly change. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm believing that Conneaut won't always look like Conneaut looks right now. When Nehemiah walked around the walls and he saw the situation, he said, yeah, I see exactly where it's at. It ain't going to look like this all the time. We're going to change this. I'm believing... Oh, I'm believing for change. I'm believing for souls. Come on, somebody that's, that's with me. I'm believing for sons and daughters prophesying. I'm believing for God's spirit to be poured out on all flesh. I'm believing over our city that there is a banner. That God indeed, his presence will come down and he himself will prosper us. Nehemiah looked at the job, and can I tell you, the job was too big for Nehemiah. When Nehemiah came in to town, I think God likes doing this. God already had it all lined up. Each person already had the talent and skill they needed. Now, if you hire me to build a wall or put up a gate, you better pray hard. <laughs> you hire Greg Feldman, and it's going to be the best. You get me over there, and I'll do my best. <laughs> and you better be careful when you walk through that gate. This job was too big for Nehemiah. But God already had an army of people Amen. that had all the gifts and anointing that they needed to accomplish what God had put in Nehemiah's heart. Yes. Hear me. You are part of the army that God has called in this city. Amen. You're not here by accident. You're not here because your parents were here. You're not here because this is your home. You're here because you're part of the army that God has placed at this time to accomplish his will in this city. Are you hearing me? Let us rise up. Let us rise up and do the work that God has called us to do. Would you stand today? Let me tell you, God's called you and God's called me. This task is bigger than you. And it's bigger than me. But that's okay. It's not bigger than him. It's not bigger than him. So what do we need? We just need his presence. We just need his presence, church. Somebody say amen. amen. Lord, we just need more of you. As they play something softly, Lord, we just need more of your presence. God, we need you in our lives. Lord, we need you. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. God, we need you right now. Holy Ghost, I pray that you would move upon us. Some of us, Lord, might still be in 
grief and mourning and hurt and pain from the past. God, we repent of sin of the past, but then we surrender that past to you. And we move on. God, we ask you that we wouldn't have our heart, but we'd have your heart. God, give us your favor. Lord, we look at the situation and we see it as it is. And now we go to work as you've called us to. And we believe in faith for greater things. God, I thank you for healings. I thank you for healings in this house. I thank you for healings in Kaniat, Ohio. Lord, I thank you. Yes, you're the healer. You're Jehovah Rapha. I thank you over Pastor Scott Walsh. Lord, for complete healing over him. Lord, even this morning, I thank you, God, over this city. Lord, that in churches around this city, Lord, I thank you for healing, for healing flowing, Lord, in your church. Yes, God, for those that aren't here this morning, Lord, we lift up Craig to you and Janet and Earl and Joyce DeWalt to you. And Lord, we lift up, Lord, all those that are struggling and just need your touch today. Lord, we just pray for Jesse Kephart. And Lord, we're asking you for your, your hand upon Jesse today. Lord, upon Al and Linda Warren. And God, upon Sandy Deemer. Lord, we pray your touch. Lord, this morning. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Lord, you're the healer. Lord, you're the healer. Lord, you're the healer. Would you just call out to him? If you know some people's names, you need to call out before the Lord for healing. Yes, God. Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Yes. Yes. You bring it to pass. You're a God that does the impossible. With you, nothing is impossible to those who believe. So, God, we believe you for greater things in our city. We believe you for an anointing of your Holy Ghost is equal to the task. Mm. God, I pray that as Christians from around this city join together this Thursday and as we declare your word over this city and as we pray together, hear from heaven, God. Let this be a turning point for our city. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for godly change in our city. Hallelujah. Now this morning, as the gentleman come, we've prayed for his presence. We've prayed for his heart. And we have the opportunity this morning to walk in obedience to his word in remembering his heart for us. What a great song they sang this morning, the, the overwhelming, reckless love of God. How deeply he loves us. So great that he would give his life for us. If you haven't experienced that, if you haven't experienced the depth of his love, can I tell you, it's right that first step that we talked about this morning. It's the repentance. It's the looking in our past and saying, Lord, I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to turn from that, and I want to surrender my life to you. Before we receive the Lord's Supper, if you want to do that, can I tell you, there's not any magical words that you say. But right now, right now, standing there in prayer, you can just ask the Lord into your heart by saying, Lord, I repent of sin. I turn away from that. And I receive you as my King, my Savior, my Lord. The Bible says it'll come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. His salvation is guaranteed when we call on his name. So that being the case, if you've called this morning, he's already heard. And you come from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And you get the opportunity this morning of joining with us in remembering the sacrifice of Jesus, that he gave his life. That he gave his life for us because he loved us so much. 
And in obedience to his word, we're going to receive the elements this morning. So I'm going to invite you to come. you receive the elements and take them with you back to your seat. And once everybody has received the elements, if you wait, we will all partake together. I invite you to come. Before we receive communion, I always encourage you to make a declaration. And I want you to declare these words with me this morning. Lord, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for calling me to walk in obedience to your word. You've forgiven my sin by your blood. Through you, I am more than a conqueror. You have called me to a great work in your kingdom. In you, I have everything I need. I recommit myself to your purpose today. Have your way in me and through me. Hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23. Paul said, for I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, let us also break of the bread and partake. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 25, he said, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, let us also drink of the cup. And in verse 26, he said, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he's coming soon. I said he's coming soon. Hallelujah. We say come quickly, Lord Jesus. Shishishan and and Araba Shushunama. In Derea, Sikroto, Roma, Area, Nete. She, she, she. Masin Derana, Sololo Rama, Elele Arando, Soko Rahamansha. Say, 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 Shatano, Si Sende Rahama. No toye. Ye. For there is a sweeping that's taking place. There is a sweeping that's flowing through this place even this morning. Hmm. There's a change that's stirring. Do you sense it? Do you feel it? I'm moving. I'm moving. I'm moving. Do you hear me? I'm moving. Hmm. I'm moving in your hearts. I'm moving in your minds. I'm moving in your body. I'm moving in your family. I'm moving in this church. I'm moving in the city. I'm moving in the area. I'm moving on to the state. I'm moving out into the nation. And I'm moving up around the world, says the Lord. Rababa, sandada, sho, 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 ramama. Yay, 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 yay. But it begins here with you today. There's a freedom and a liberty that I'm loosing in this house, says the Lord. Mm. Mm. What has hindered you for a while, says the Lord, I'm breaking it. I'm breaking it. I'm breaking it. 
You've already sensed it for the past couple of weeks, says the Lord. There's been a loosening and a freedom. But a greater is coming. Greater is coming. Greater is coming. Greater is coming. Yes. 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 Hmm. Hmm. Listen for my voice. Listen for my voice daily. Listen for me to lead you, to teach you, to show you where I want you to go, what I want you to do. I'm going to put you in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put you in the right place at the right time for ministry, but also for outpouring back onto you, for the favor of my spirit. Mm. Yes, is flowing. What has been held back from you is about to be released. Mm. Mm. Whether it's financial, whether it's healing, whether it's open doors in your family. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. Do you hear me? By my spirit, I'm moving. I'm moving. Are you ready to receive? Are you ready to gather in? Are you ready to work for me? Are you ready to move with me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Get ready this morning even, because I'm about to pour out. Open yourself to me fully, says the Lord. Open yourself fully to me. Hold nothing back from me today. Yes, hold nothing back from me, says the Lord.